Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to start a new unit. We finished up with electric fields and electric forces and circuits last time. Today we're going to start looking at a new force, a new field. This brings us to section 21, magnetic forces and magnetic fields. I'd like to start out with the same demonstration that I began electric fields. I just want to review that for a second. Here I have some little paper circles from a uh, hole punch, and I'm going to put them on this little uh, plastic plate here. Spread them out a little bit. I'm going to take a comb. I'm going to comb it through my hair, just like we did last time, the, the, when we did this demonstration. Bring it down, and we notice that it attracts the paper circles. But I would like to do something a little bit different also. Okay, I need to comb my hair some more. It's, it's a very humid day today, and humid days tend to make it harder to charge things up so we don't get quite as much charge. What I'd like to do now, though, is once charged, I'm going to take these paper circles. I'm going to touch them all with my hand. Then I'm going to take the comb put my comb through my hair, just like I did, okay, get a charge on it, but now I'm going to touch my comb, I'm going to touch it all over with my hand, and now let's try this again, bring this down to the paper circles, and what happens? There is no force at all, no attraction. We understand now from, from what we did with our electric field, I can charge up my comb, but if I touch my comb with my hands, and the same with the paper circles, I discharge it. And once it's discharged, there's no more force. Well, let's do another demonstration, but in this case, I'm going to use some little metal circles. These are some little steel washers. And here I have another piece of metal. And what do we notice when I bring this piece of metal close to those? Again, they are attracted. Well, this is a different force than the one we've seen before. This is not the electric force, this is the magnetic force. However, if I try to do the same thing that I did with the comb, I'll take these off, touch them all over with my hand, and I'll take the magnet, touch the magnet all over with my hand, bring the magnet, bring the magnet back to the uh, washers, and what happens? They are still attracted. There is no way to so-called discharge the magnet. Well, this is a new force. It's a different force than we have talked about before. You've probably seen magnets before. Uh, but we're going to look at the magnetic force and the magnetic field in more detail. Rather than the, the way we did it with the electric field where we talked about what causes the electric field and then what kind of effect does it have on charges, we're going to actually go the other way around. We're going to talk about what kind of effect does the magnetic field have on charges, and then later on we'll talk about what creates magnetic fields. Where does it come from? But I'd like to talk just a little bit about the history, just for a second. The uh, magnetic field, or magnets, were first discovered in the area of Greece called Magnesia, and that's where we get the name magnets, magnetism, from this area, Magnesia. It was discovered that there were certain types of stones that we call lodestones that were attracted to the iron nails in soldiers' boots. And that attractive force then uh, led people to start looking at these lodestones. And one thing they noticed that was very, very interesting, and that is if one of these magnets, one of these lodestones, was suspended, it always aligned itself in the same direction what we would say toward the North Pole, or approximately toward the North Pole. So rather than charges for the electric field where we talk about positive and negative charges, for the magnetic field we'll talk about, po uh, sorry, we will talk about the North Pole of a magnet and the South Pole of a magnet, where the North Pole of a magnet is what is always drawn towards or points towards the North Pole of the Earth, the South Pole of the magnet points towards the South Pole. So, 
rather than positive and negative. Charges, like we have for the electric field, will have north and south poles for the magnetic field. So let's just write that down. So for the electric field, we have positive and negative charges. For the magnetic field, so this is the electric field, for the magnetic field, we'll have north and south poles. Now, what kind of forces do we have? We know with the electric field, we have that opposite charges attracted each other. Similar charges repelled each other. Well, let's take a look with the uh, magnetic field. I have two magnets here that are on both sides, they're attracting each other, on both sides of a little wooden strip. What I'm going to do is suspend this strip from the ceiling and then we'll be able to take a look at what kind of forces we're talking about. Be right back. Here we are, I have suspended this stick from the ceiling and I've got these two magnets, one on each side. I already tested these magnets and this is the north side of the magnet and this is the south side. And here I have another magnet and we'll actually just test this one. So I'll suspend this and what we find is even if I push this, it always aligns itself so that this end, and I happen to know that's the north direction, so this end must be the north side of the magnet. This end is the south side, the south pole of the magnet. Now I'll just take this and I will bring the north end of this magnet near the north end of this magnet. Let's see what happens. Well, it's repelled. It's repelled from the north end. Again, let's see, bring it over, and it's repelled. Now, I'll turn this around and take the south end of the magnet. I'll bring the south end close to this north end of this magnet, but we've got to be a little bit careful. These are very strong magnets, and they uh, have a tendency to snap together, so let's just see what happens here. We can see that it's attracted. The north end of this side is attracted to the south end of this side. One more time. There we go. We can see the attraction. If I were to bring this too close, they would smash together and these magnets could actually uh, 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 chip off bits because the, uh, the force coming together is so, uh, so strong. It's like smashing two things together. Okay, very, very good. Let's take this down and get back to work. I just said let's get back to work, but I really should have said let's get back to fun. This is more fun than work, isn't it? Well, I hope so. It's fun for me. I hope it's fun for you. What did we see? Well, just like with the electric field, we had opposite signs, opposite charges attracted, like signs uh, repel, like, uh, like sign charges or like charges repel. We have that like poles repel. So when I brought two north poles together, we saw that they pushed each other apart. I didn't do this, but I'd love for you to try it. If you have some magnets, see if you can figure out which is the north and the south pole, then actually give it a try. And if you bring two south ends of the magnets together, two south poles, you will see that they also repel each other. But like poles attract, so that if you bring a north pole and a south pole near each other, they will be attracted toward each other. One thing I want us to notice just before we go any further is that the force on each pole is always in the opposite direction. If the force on this one is to the left, the force on this one is to the right. If the force on this one is to the left, the force on this one is to the right. If the force on this one is to the right, the force on this one is to the left. And the magnitudes of the forces are always equal. The forces are always equal and opposite. Well, what does that sound like? Newton's third law. So the magnetic force also obeys Newton's third law, as we would hope it would, or we might even expect it to. Very, very good. Now, uh, let's think about this just for a second. Remember, the north pole of a magnet was the one that was attracted toward the north pole of the Earth. Now, if the north pole of a magnet is attracted to the north pole of the Earth, what must be up there? Well, there must be a south magnetic pole at the north pole of the Earth. Well, that's very interesting. There's a south magnetic pole 
not exactly at the same place as the North Geographic Pole. The North Geographic Pole would be where is that axis of rotation. So if the Earth is rotating around, that North Magnetic Pole would be that point kind of through the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the North Geographic Pole would be that point where the pole is through the Earth, where the Earth is rotating around. The South Magnetic Pole is actually about 1,500 kilometers away from that. That makes a little bit of a problem when you're near the North Pole because the your North Pole of the magnet is not going to be pointing exactly toward the North Geographic Pole. It actually never points exactly towards it unless you happen to be directly in line between those things. But it can actually point in the opposite direction. If you are right in between the two, your magnet would point, your magnetic compass would point in the opposite direction of the direction toward the North Geographic Pole. So uh, that's just something to keep in mind. But it's a very interesting thing to, to, to realize that the North Geographic Pole is near the South Magnetic Pole of the Earth. Very good. Now, what about other forces? What force does a magnetic field exert, say, on a, uh, an electric charge or something like that? Well, first, what do I mean by a magnetic field? Let's think about that just for a second. When we were studying electric fields, we found that the electric fields came out of positive charges and went into negative charges. And we could draw these field diagrams using some of those ideas. Electric field lines coming out of positive charges going into negative charges. For the magnetic field, we have something very similar. We have magnetic field lines coming out of north poles and going into south poles. Well, why didn't I just draw a single north pole, kind of like a, a, a point charge that we did with the electric field, or a single south pole? Well, it turns out that as far as we know, you cannot have a north pole without a south pole. If you take a magnet with a North Pole and a South Pole, and you break it in half, you don't get just a North Pole and just a South Pole, you just get a smaller magnet with another North Pole and another South Pole. And the other one now has another North Pole and another South Pole. You could take this and break it in half, and you'd get a smaller magnet with a North Pole and a South Pole, and then a North Pole at the other end, and a South Pole at this end. So you can't have just one with, and I'm going to put these back together, and I've got to be, again, like I said, very careful. This one already has some little chips coming off of it. To put these together without them slamming together. There we go. Oop. The, magnet on, the other magnet on my table just smashed into the first one. Um, so we can never have one without the other. As far as we know, there are no particles with just a North Pole or just a South Pole. As far as we know, there are no magnetic monopoles. Why is that the case? Why, there are, why are there no particles that just have a North Pole or just a South Pole? Like we have protons, which are just positive particles, electrons, which are just negative particles. Why don't we have something similar with the magnetic field? That's a very interesting question, and physicists are still kind of working on that. Maybe you will solve that if, uh, if you decide to go into more advanced physics. Very good. Okay, so we are going to draw our magnetic field lines, similar to the way we drew electric field lines. But just to mention one more thing, the symbol that we'll, we will use for magnetic fields is a capital letter B. Not an M, but a capital letter B. It's a kind of an, an interesting historical uh, story as to why uh, B is used. When James Clerk Maxwell, who did an amazing amount of work developing electric and magnetic fields and working with the equations into four fundamental uh, equations that describe the electric and the magnetic fields, they are similar to electricity and magnetism as Newton's laws are to mechanics, and they are called Maxwell's equations. He, he uh, developed these four equations to describe uh, all sorts of electric and magnetic properties. And 
as he was doing that, he defined a whole bunch of different vector fields. The A field, B field, C, D, E, F, etc., etc. Well, over time, it turned out that uh, some of those were not quite so important as others of these vector fields. Some of them were kind of superfluous. And so, uh, over, the, over the years, some of them were, were removed, so to speak, but the B field is what we still use to represent the magnetic field, and so we still use the, uh, the letter that, that James Kirk, Clerk Maxwell originally defined for this quantity. So, we'll have B for the magnetic field, E for, and what did we use for this? We had E for the electric field. So what I'd like to talk about is what kind of force does the magnetic field exert on a charge? We have the electric field exerting forces on electric charges. We looked at that before. What kind of force does the magnetic field exert? Let's take a look at that. 